Hi, my name is Andrew Just, and I'm going to introduce to you the probability of weather type, or PAUT, methodology. So what is the PAUT methodology? Well, it's this collection of GFE procedures and tools uh, that's been around for a, a long time, since 2007, um, developed with input from many for forecasters and managers, especially from Central Region, basically as multiple precipitation type events have impacted um, these offices have had the probably weather type installed may make modifications to help handle it. It's also a database management for all weather types. Um, that the goal here make it easier to edit and update as well as develop tools because what we're going to be doing here is working with scalar grids that are zero to hundred percent versus the ugly strings in the weather grid as shown there like for likely light rain and light snow. It's also a meteorologically and statistically consistent process, so you're not going to be seeing freezing rain at 36 or 37, for example. Um, your, your QPF and snow and your types will all match up. It's also, regarding snow and ice, it's also an approach to never have to edit snow amount ice accumulation and weather grids. And without this methodology, those grids can be a bear during complex weather. This will make it simpler for you. Uh, also, the big one again is kind of highlighted in red above, update. And also a way to provide additional DSS information I'll show you an example here from what we do here in Lacrosse, where we have this experimental product going out that contains not just information that we typically have from the grids like temperature, wind speed, direction, things like that, but you see a few new things that are these precipitation type probabilities for rain, snow, sleep, freezing rain, and as well as some non precipitation types like thunder, fog, and blowing snow. This could be good for maybe some of your core partners, like road commit, you know, road crews, for example. Many benefits to this me methodology. The first is a strong science background. There's like a top-down approach in here. There's good divvy, nice divvying up of QPF to get your snow and ice. Uh, just for some quick examples. The methods are quicker to get you through nasty precipitation type events, and this was an actual quote from a forecaster at Louisville. There's consistency on numerous levels. You've got consistency for precipitation intensity, say from shift to shift, office to office, uh, something we haven't had. You'll have QPF, uh, how much of that's going into snow and ice. Uh, also, forecaster to forecaster and, and from office to office, and basically, in summary, internal meteorological consistency. It also provides easier tool development and quicker research to operations in Fusion thanks to the scalar grids. So let me give you a quick overview of the process. The first part is something most of us already do. They, we'll call these the foundation grids. The temperatures, dew points, winds, pop, uh, QPF snow ratio. Uh, the next, next group might be new to you. These are the top-down grids. Uh, you may or may not have to edit these. Depends on the weather situation. You know, if you get into sleep, freeze, and rain situations, these will become more handy. But we're going to consider these two groups, foundation and top-down, are environmental inputs. And really, this is where you're spending your time especially in the foundation grids, because um, everything downstream of this is going to basically be derived uh, using GFE procedures that are going to be based on these inputs. The, the first of which being these precipitate and probability type grids, which are conditional. Um, so basically that means, uh, you know, what's the chance of seeing uh, rain assuming precipitation occurs? We're going to take the environmental inputs and in those precipitation and probability type grids and then also, via GFE procedure, derive out snow and ice. This next step is about non-precipitating types may be based off your foundation grids. For example, blown snow. Um, you need your wind grid for that. And then the last step here, we'll take everything together and make a weather grid. And that's also a GFE procedure doing that. And if you've gone through the forecast builder training, this is basically the same thing here, that we're following the same process and deriving it. It's not a competing thing here, it's actually 
the pulp being a backbone for the forecast builder. Just that forecast builder is a nice coaching style process to go through each of these steps. First step we're going to look at here in the process is the environmental input for the foundation grids. Again, these are things that we pretty much do already. So you want to make sure to edit and collaborate these. These are, again, the temperatures, your dew points, winds, pop, QPF, snow ratio. Again, I'd say it's the most important step. Spend your time here. Get these right. Collaborate. Whatever you got to do. Um, if you look at this in Forecast Builder, you'll see it's one of the first steps that you have to do. Uh, it's the second step after choosing what the time range is. Uh, and you'll see the same kind of listing of elements there. All right, next we'll jump to the top-down group. The top-down idea here is basically you forecast the environment and the precipitation type probabilities will drop out. It's a much simpler approach and a lot easier to update um, as you, when you're going through mixed, mixed precipitation type weather. Most of it consists of, of three grids and you just edit those as you need. Um, you have data for the for them from the RAP, the NAM, the GFS. You can blend them as well. That's nice. You're not restricted to one model. Uh, and you know perhaps there's a chance that the models are all messed are all messed up and not handling things correctly. Well you have the ability to manipulate these grids um, to get them to fit your meteorological situation. You can also include road temperatures if you're dealing with something say like ice in, uh, F on roads during a, just a typical rain event because you've been in cold weather for so long. More details on the top-down grids can be found in the top-down module. Next let's jump to the precipitate and probability type grids. So first off, what are these probability type grids anyway? Well, they're all scalar grids that have values of 0 to 100 percent for each weather type. So there will be 19 plus you'll have types for uh, severe and heavy freezing spray. These are broken into three groups, the first being precipitating. And again, the precipitating ones are conditional. So you can kind of say something like, assuming precipitation occurs, what is the probability I'm going to see rain? What is the probability I'm going to see snow, etc. You don't have to bring in the pop in at this at this point. It's just, hey, what's the probability this type is going to occur? Then there's the non-precip type group: fog, haze, blowing snow, blowing dust, freezing spray, things like that. And lastly, the special types, which kind of take into some uh, some of the precipitating and non-precipitating uh, qualities, if you will. You know, most of these grids are created via tools, uh, so they'll go. You'll go through them pretty quickly. Uh, you won't have to spend much much time. They're going to be based mostly off your environmental inputs. So for these precipitating types, um, how do you get uh, the weather from them? Well, you'll take your these conditional grids uh, for probabilities of rain, snow, etc. We're going to multiply them by the pop. So if you had like a 100% uh, probability of rain and a 70 pop for the weather grid, you'll end up with likely rain. Now, if you get in a scenario where you have a lot of precipitation types, there's a meteorological check that occurs that makes sure that at least one of those elements contains the value of the pop. Because there is, there you have potential for that not to occur, so there's a check. So let's just take a example look here, um, just a fictitious one that I produce here when I ran some uh, top-down tools in Forecast Builder. Again, this is automatically produced. As I said, these precipitating types are automatically generated. So here's the probability of rain. Here's the probability of sleet. The probability of freezing rain. And the probability of snow. Again, I have not considered pop in this case, but these are just what, if precipitation were to occur, what the probabilities it, probabilities are. Note that these would be pretty hard to hand draw. <laughs> you, you're going to do them really quick and easy through the top down stuff. And again, that's in the top down module. Next, let's look at snow amount and ice accumulation. And these are completely derived. For creating snow and ice accumulation, again, 
provided GFE procedures will do the do these for you. Basically, you never have to touch them again. Uh, here in La Crosse, we haven't touched a snow and ice accumulation grid for probably well over five years um, since creating the procedure to do snow and ice provides for fast updates and ongoing weather so if you you know you need to make a change to um, let's say temperatures that's impacting your snow and ice you update your temperatures rerun the types in snow and ice and there they via procedures you're done you can also view some additional grids they're not required at this point but you have them there to view for sleet amounts, horizontal, and radial ice accumulations. And these ice accumulation grids will come out of the FRAM model. So a little more info here in the snow and ice using these probability type grids that you can parse out the QPF into each type. So to give you a quick rundown of the equations that are used for the various uh, accumulation grids here, for snow amount, we're going to take the QPF of the, that belongs to snow. Again, we got that from the probability type uh, grid, multiply it by the snow ratio, and then add in the sleet amount. The sleet amount happens to be the QPF that goes to sleet, multiply it by a ratio 2 to 1, uh, the sleet ro ratio, if you will. Ice accumulation is going to be whatever comes out of the fram for ice flat. The ice flat accumulation happens to be the QPF that goes into freezing rain or freezing drizzle, and we're going to multiply that by the ice ratio. Uh, and then the ice line accumulation is approximately 40% of the ice flat accum. And again, this, all this information for how you get to ice flat and ice line accum is in the uh, training for the FRAM model. And more information about the whole creation of snow and ice accumulations can be found in the snow and ice accumulation module. This is just a very brief overview. Next step, non-precipitation types. Kind of looking at the same kind of view as we did with the precipitating types. Here for the non-precipitating types, they're con considered coverage. Again, same thing, scalar grids, values 0 to 100. You have, again, probably frost, haze, etc. We're going to use the 10204 directive for the ZFP appendix and apply these various definitions. So if you put in a 20% probability of frost, the result will be patchy frost. Then there's the special types like thunder, water spell, flurries, and sprinkles. Here we're going to use a flavor of the precipitating type um, where we've got values for that are similar to, again, what those use. Um, oops, sorry, and come up with a weather grid. So, like, for example, if we do a 20% chance of uh, thunder, that's a slight chance in the weather grid. So, modifying these grids. Uh, Forecast Builder uh, has a number of embedded tools uh, inside of it to populate the grids. Um, here's coming out of one of the steps uh, that you can see some of the grids that are uh, included. I would say this is an area that needs more research and development, uh, but please reference the non-precipitation type module for more information on non-precipitation types. There's also information on how to deal with severe storms in that module. Finally, the creation of the weather grid. As you see from the process, there's a lot of grids being incorporated here. You've got the POP, the probability type grids, the QPF, the snow amount and sleet amount get included for intensity. Also any hazards, um, they're going to be brought in. And so the grids can become messy. Uh, don't panic. <laughs> uh, you, the formatters and point and click will simplify it. Uh, big, most importantly, your meteorological integrity will be preserved. Uh, so all the way through the process here, you're going to see the preservation. And again, that's, that's going to give you that messiness look. But again, most importantly, you've got integrity here. And you'll also have consist consistency from office to office if those foundation and top-down grids, the environmental inputs, are collaborated and seamless. Here's a quick uh, look at how the intensities are derived for weather from, you know, if you're just like for rain and freezing rain, just taking out of the QPF 
and QPF grid, your snow, uh, based on some air, our, our advisory warning criteria, at least for a really good starting point for intensity. Uh, and then sleet is sort of based on some warning criteria here. Uh, hazards. Again, they get included into the weather grid, and this is applicable to the severe thunderstorm watch, tornado watch, flash, flash flood, flood watch, and dense fog advisories. And that weather grid is going to get fragmented as needed to match those hazard grids. Uh, and then the contents of that weather grid will be adjusted. Again, some examples would include the, th the any thunderstorm chances will get upgraded to T+. Plus for the severe thunderstorm tornado watch areas. Similarly, like dense fog advisories, if you have an F, it's going to go to F+. Plus. Optional attributes can also be applied where, um, say, a severe thunderstorm watch exists. Again, this is just an example, uh, and you'll see that in the GUI. So here's an example result from December 1st, 2007, which was a a crazy mixed precipitation type event here in La Crosse where we are dealing with a warm layer and a dry slot and a shallow cold dome. Pretty much everything <laughs> that you could possibly have was included here. And so you could kind of see that warm, warm nose moving north and then the dry slot that came in. Um, it's just an example. Again, you see that you get the messiness uh, from because again, we've got to consider things like intensity, the type, the coverage, or probability. So in summary, the probability weather type methodology makes it easy to update and keep the forecast meteorologically consistent. Uh, based on the environmental inputs, again, you control them, it derives out the probabilities, and we use strong science to get those probabilities. And then going back to that forecast builder procedure, it will help coach you through the process. You don't have to remember, okay, I got to do this first, and this, and this. Oh, I messed up here. No, using forecast builder, it will help you move along through the process correctly. You won't forget anything. Um, one of the big benefits for forecast builder. If you pull up the full documentation for the probability weather type methodology, it will give you a lot more detail, even behind, a lot more even behind the scenes for some tools, etc. If you have any feedback, feel free to email me. My email address there, andy.just at noah.gov. And that's it.